Thank you very much, Len. Uh, Sound-wise, is that okay? Can everybody hear me all right? Mm -hmm. For those that don't know me, I'm Nick Meller. I work for Lear. Uh, I got conned into doing this some time back by, I mean, you know the other people I'm talking here. It, it's, it's Len's involved, David's involved, Stefan's involved. So they're the guilty parties. They, they suggested I came here and talked about education and training. Now, anyone that knows anything about Lear and anything about me knows that actually education and training is not my strong suit. Um, I'm still trying to work out what my strong suit is, but it's not education and training. So I'm just going to do a few quick slides to, to get into our presentation. And then I'm going to hand over to Lawrence. And Lawrence is our safety and training guy. So you know he's overworked, because within Lear, I only ever really do technical stuff. But Lawrence actually has two committees to take care of. So he's always a hassled, worried looking guy and I've managed to con him to come up and talk to you with a bit more authority about things like NVQs and apprenticeships than I can talk. Anyway, I'm going to do the, um, the first few slides. I'm going to talk about Lear Distance Learning Courses. So, I, I mean, I think we know that there's broadly two areas that, that we have in, in the UK. We have some vocational style qualifications, and again, Lawrence will, will, will talk about those. And we have some knowledge-based qualifications. Um, and it, it, in, in, within that, if you like, world of the knowledge-based qualifications, the Lear distance learning courses are you know, quite important. But they're not the only ones, and they, they sit alongside the things that Stefan will talk about later, HNC foundation degree and MSc here at, at Northampton. So I won't encroach onto Stefan's area, I'll just talk about distance learning. It's actually been around for a surprisingly long time now. The first distance learning courses were put together now 30 years ago, uh, really to reflect the needs of the industry. I mean, ultimately, LEA is a, an industry association. Um, and we reflected the needs of our members at that time, or let's say the, the forerunner of LEA. Um, and the, the certain number of units were put together. Uh, since then, they've, they've been added to. Um, most recently, the most recent major overhaul a few years back saw the IOSH uh, Managing Safely uh, module, uh, construction, a construction management module, and one on stair lifts. So again, going back to the history of LEAR, <coughs> reflecting the, the, if, if like the, the, the broadening of our um, association at that time, because we did uh, the, the original BLA and now did merge with the, the Stairlift Association. Incidentally, I should just mention that all, all this material is on our website. It's quite easy to, to look under. If you go onto our home page, there's a tab called Education and Training. All this material's there. If anybody actually <coughs> wants a copy of the slides, just, just tap me on the shoulder afterwards and let me have your email address and I, I can send it to you. But there is our um, range of modules that we have. Um, and th there's three and four letter acronyms on the left-hand side, which are completely impenetrable. So on the right-hand column, uh, there's an exp explanation of what that, that means. Um, so there's a number of different modules covering the majority of our technology. And again, if you're interested, I think we've got some brochures, but also all this material is on our website. So if you actually do a LEAR distance learning uh, module, you, you can actually start it at three times during the year. And again, this is, this is something practical, which people undertaking these courses, they need that sort of flexibility. They can't always wait until the next September intake, as it were. Um, and, and, and they, realistically, they can get a full module done through the year. Um, and they can even miss an end test and have another go at the end test. And what I'd just like to point out is that there is actually a character um, not a million miles away from you who's actually never completed a Lear Distance Learning course, even though I did try, I did start one on a number of occasions. And, and the problem I always had was that, that my managing director always had a better job for me to do on the day of the end test. And when you've got you know, problems to sort out in the field, um, you know, that, that they take priority in a lift company. So this whole thing about flexibility is really important. 
uh, more recently, we've revamped the layout of uh, the course reference book and uh, the learning packages. So that there's, there's, there's two two parts of two written parts of a of each of these near distance learning modules. Um, also recently, we, we've revamped it uh, to include the requirements of say EN eighty one twenty. So so it always needs continually, um, if you like, revising to keep keep up to date with new standards. Um, materials now, I mean, again, you know, we heard this morning about all sorts of wonderful possibilities for platforms, uh, you know, using IT. Um, the important thing for us is that at least we've now got the material available, uh, you know, on a memory stick or an SD card, um, but, but some sort of online format. So we, we've moved decisively away from the old paper-based I mean that's what a that's that's what the front page looks like. It even though it's it, you know it's it's PDF, it still looks very much like the old version, and, and no doubt in the future we need to yeah revamp and look at the formats. So, I mean coming back to my um, failure to ever pass an end test, um, <laughs> it's, it's becoming a bit of a confessional. Um, but actually, when I look at, when Lawrence and I talk about uh, the distance learning end tests, uh, they're actually surprisingly difficult. And there's a, an 80% pass mark on these things. They're not, they're not easy things to get through. Um, and of course, occasionally, someone will, will, will email us and say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't agree with, with the, the grade you've given me or something. And we do scrutinize these and look at them. And I, I'm always... I always finish up by thinking, well, I'm very, very glad that I'm not taking these things uh, because they are not easy. Uh, you know, the end tests are not easy. It, all our assessments now are done you know, online, electronically. Um, there's, there's no written uh, test as such. But I don't think that's in any way to suggest that it's easier uh, than it what might have been in the past. In terms of you know, accreditation or, or bits of paper that you get, um, you can get a certificate of unit achievement um, from us for completing these things. And the IOSH uh, course, the IOSH uh, issue a, a certificate uh, on, on, on completion of that. So th that really uh, brings me to the end of distance learning. I can see the next slide up is on vocational training. So I'm going to sit down and uh, let Lawrence take over. Right. Thanks, Cheers. Nick. Um, I'd just like to add, Nick, uh, the, the distance learning course now, uh, we have a mitigating circumstances policy. So if, you're, um, if your boss does tell you that you've got to go and work on a particular day, you do have the opportunity to claim mitigating circumstances. So if anybody's on the course now, feel, gets into that position, um, send, in, send in an email as fast as you can. Can I post date my no. <laughs> No, nope, you cannot. Right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, right, I'm going to be talking about the uh, vocational training, VQ side of this, um, how the vocational training is derived, why do we have vocational training, uh, looking at the specific uh, VQs uh, related to the lift industry, um, looking at the, the LEA assessment centre, because we are an assessment centre uh, ourselves, and then very, very briefly, talk about the uh, apprenticeships um, that I'm sure everybody's aware of at the moment. Um, so at, at, the, at the top of the tree is the government. Uh, they are the ones who set the specification uh, for the national vocational qualifications. Uh, what you can see up there, QCF, NVQ, and I've put the whole line, the, the whole definition of it up there, the qualifications, credit framework, national vocational qualifications. It's a mouthful, I know, but the, you should see the length of the, uh, the titles of the qualifications themselves, and I'll come to that in a minute. So the Office of Qualifications and Examinations Regulations are at the top of the tree. Uh, they set the specification. The, uh, the next body down, uh, Sector Skills Councils, are regulated organisations. They prepare uh, what are called the National Occupational Standards, NOS, uh, to use a nasty acronym. Um, these define very, very individual parts of the work that, that uh, the, the learners will be undertaking. 
Uh, those NOS are used uh, by awarding organisations, the, uh, the, the next line down in the, in the tree. Um, those awarding organisations will actually develop the NBQ, so th they are the ones who uh, use the NOS, they will, set the, they will define what, the, what is in the National Vocational Qualification um, and give the award. They are the ones who come up with the certificates at the end of the day. Um, it covers every industry just about, not just lifts, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Just to highlight a, a few names, uh, there's Ofqual as the regulator at the top. SEMTA, Construction Skills, ECITB are um, sector skills councils. There are dozens of sector skills councils, I've just taken a few uh, simply to give you a few names. Um, SEMTA are the ones, SEMTA are one of the uh, successor organisations to the EITB. Um, which is which is why we tend to go in that direction. We haven't uh, we haven't gone for uh, another of the sector skills councils. The next line down, you can see, uh, are the awarding organisations, uh, and EAL are uh, the, the awarding organisation that we use. They're the ones that we are a, uh, a centre of. City and Guilds are another. C uh, Skills Awards are another. McDonald's, believe it or not, the hamburger company are an awarding organisation in their own right. And as you can see there, ECITB are also an awarding organisation. So there's plenty of, of, uh, of different organisations involved. The um, one thing that I did, uh, I did come across uh, as part of the sort of um, research I did, there are quite a few um, lift and escalators, national vocational qualifications, not just EAL. Uh, as I said, the EAL are the ones that we use simply because they are, the, they are the successor organisation to EITB. City and Guilds have their own, uh, uh, exactly the same uh, NVQs, which are just as valid as the ones that uh, are assessed through our centre. There are other organisations which do the same thing. So it isn't, it isn't just about, um, there isn't just one organisation that does all of this uh, for everybody. Uh, curiously, there has been... Um, the Sainsbury report uh, has recently been published uh, into the technical uh, training in the UK. Um, they advocated that the, the, this multitude of awarding organisations should be reduced, um, which is an interesting uh, concept. It means effectively that uh, there would be one, or one awarding organisation that, that, would, that would offer a, uh, the, the, the qualifications that we, uh, that we have assessed through our centre. But that's something for the future. So, looking at, uh, have I gone too far? No, this is why, why vocational training? Um, one thing that uh, did push the numbers of uh, vocational, vocational qualifications, the number of enrolments up recently, uh, were, were the, the, the three codes of practices that have been developed. Uh, 7255 for lifts, um, 7801 for escalators, 9102 for platform lifts. There is in there, in, the, in, the, uh, in that code of practice, there is the, um, the definition of NVQs as suitable qualifications. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are mandated. Um, and I, I've explained to a couple of people that the, the, uh, the, there, there is no mandatory qualification, despite what it says in the code of practice. The, 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 the qualification is listed as an example of, uh, of good practice, uh, but it isn't a mandatory qualification. What's behind the NVQ? Well, it's a recognition of competency. Um, it's obtained by assessment of demonstration of competence. So there isn't the case of um, taking, a, uh, taking a written test or, well, there can be a, take, a written test, but by and large, uh, the NVQs are awarded or assessed by somebody going to a person and saying, show me how you do this, show me how to do that particular bit of work, show me this, show me that. Distance learning course, the other part of, uh, of the, the LEAR remit, is definitely a, a, tell me, uh, a tell me course. You can pass the uh, distance learning course with 70% pass. Uh, it is high, I agree, and Nick's quite right. It is a difficult thing to, to get through, but a 70% pass will get you through. NVQs are 100%. You've got, to, you've got to be competent in order to get an NVQ. 
And that's one reason why CSCS use the NVQs. They don't, they don't accept academic qualifications. They want somebody to be competent at the work they do, which is why they choose uh, NVQs. When the learners are doing the NVQ, they produce a portfolio of evidence, and I'm sure any employers will have come across that before. Um, you end up with uh, a ring binder, or several ring binders occasionally, depending on how much work is done. But that isn't everything. That isn't all of the uh, assessment that is done. There are lots of other ways of assessing people, and the, the assessors uh, will, uh, will tend to go for everything that they can. So there's obviously observation. Uh, somebody's doing something at work, and the assessor can go along and see that they're actually doing what they say they can do. There is the portfolio of evidence, the gathering of information by the individual, by the learner. Um, there's also witness statements, information provided by supervisors and managers. Um, work on the different assignments and projects that, they're looking, they're, that they are assigned to. Questioning, um, how do you do that? Show me how you do that. In this day, day and age of inclusivity as well, um, we have to include video and photographic records. So if somebody is doing something, they can, they can get somebody to take a photo of them, of them doing that work. There is a video record of them uh, of actually doing, uh, undertaking the work. Other oral evidence, uh, so voice recording is accepted uh, as an assessment uh, method. Um, other training as well, company training, uh, as, long as, it's, um, as long as it's aimed at, uh, directly at what the, uh, what the learner is doing. So there are very, lots of different ways of uh, undertaking assessments. Moving on to what qualifications that are, uh, are actually offered specific to the lift and escalator industry. Uh, we've got the level two qualification, uh, which is invariably for the uh, stair lifts, service lifts, uh, lifting platforms, um, installing and servicing of each. And each of those individual sections is what we call one pathway. So the qualification itself is, as the title as you see, EAL level two NVQ diploma in engineering maintenance and installation. And that's what comes at the top of the certificate. The pathway defines the specialism that, uh, that you're looking at. The other level two qualification that's uh, through LEA is the basic lift safety. Um, and these are uh, minimum qualifications for any work, uh, anybody who is working on or near a lift, escalator or whatever. The level three qualification is the next stage up for the larger pieces of equipment for lifts and escalators. And again, uh, different pathways define the different specialisms. Um, there are two, uh, uh, two NVQs, uh, engineering maintenance and installation and commissioning, but each one of those has its own separate pathways. Um, all of those six, in fact, all of the level two qualifications as well, they all have effectively four uh, common uh, units for regulations and safety requirements, using engineering drawings, working efficiently, uh, handing over and completion. Those are all common to just about every qualification. And then the specialisms come uh, after that. The level four qualification, this is one that causes a lot of confusion. You'll see it's called a level four certificate in performing testing operations in the lift and escalator industry, brackets QCF. QCF came into being uh, back in about 2008 and this was one of the first qualifications um, that, was, that was derived for, uh, under the QCF. Um, and those of you around at the time will appreciate the work that Terry Potter did in order to gain, in order to uh, derive that qualification. There is no NVQ level four. Um, I'd just like to point that out. Uh, it's a colloquialism that's grown up within the industry. The, the, the qualification that people have from years ago was never an NVQ. It is simply uh, a, a, unit, a, a certificate of unit credit. The NVQ requires uh, so, you know, a, a defined amount of guided learning hours, a, a defined amount of credits before it can be called an NVQ. The, the lift industry took the pragmatic view that all they needed was uh, a certain number of units in a particular specialisms in order, to, in order to be acceptable for the work that was being done. And that was the arrangement that was made with EAL. Um, 
This qualification, the level four, was derived from that, but it now has the, the backing of the QCF, so it is a recognised qualification. Talking very briefly about the LEA centre, uh, we are an assessment centre in our own right, um, but we don't do any assessment. That's done by the satellite centres that are associated with us. Um, all of the work, all of the, um, the, the, the all of the registrations are done by LEA, all of the certifications are done by LEA, but the assessment itself is done by the satellite centres. You end up with uh, a LEA logo on the, sat on the certificate, which is very appealing for some people, uh, adds distinction to it, and I think a lot of people will appre do appreciate that. So, uh, in terms of the vocational training, the LEA centre, there is an advantage in us being uh, an assessment centre. We have, um, we have a good idea, we have a good uh, handle on the numbers of, uh, of, of candidates going through the qualification. We're not the only, we're not the only assessment centre that does it. As I said, there's sitting guilds, there are other um, training providers who, who will undertake their own NVQ. We reckon about 90 to 95% of uh, lift and escalator qualifications come through us. Uh, which gives us a lot of clout when we're dealing with the likes of CEMTA and EAL if we need to develop the uh, national occupational standards or we need to upgrade one of the qualifications, one of the NVQs. Um, we don't do it just for LEA members, obviously. The, this is something that is done for the whole of the, lift, uh, the UK lift and escalator industry. Uh, very, very briefly going on to apprenticeships. Um, You'll all, I'm sure you'll all appreciate, you'll have heard of the, the trailblazer uh, that's coming into, coming into place at the moment. Um, there is a fundamental change behind apprenticeships. One of the things that the government are trying to remove is the very heavyweight uh, documentation, the specification behind it. Um, this document is about 400 pages long and covers engineering manufacture in England only. Uh, all of the... Uh, all of the qualifications uh, are separated, devolved to the various countries. Uh, so there are four separate uh, specifications for, NVQ, uh, for, for apprenticeships, which means there are four separate uh, lists of awarding organisations, four separate sets of sector skills councils. But obviously some of them will work on, within, their own, within lots of countries, but at the same time it, is, it does mean that uh, you have to know which apprenticeship that you're going for uh, or which apprenticeship your, your employees are going for. Um, the government thinking behind the change uh, it, in this is really behind is really the Richard Review, which was undertaken in 2012. The principle of the Richard Review was essentially going back to a more modern version of the medieval apprentices, apprenticeships, where it was the employer who was the determinant uh, the determiner of the, uh, the competence of one of their employees. They were the ones who did the training, they were the ones who did the assessments, they were the ones who did the test at the end uh, to determine whether that man could go and then go and become a journeyman and get, go and train people himself. And the, the, in, in principle, that sounds great, the whole thing has been overcome or overshadowed by the um, the discussions around how it's going to be funded um, and this is where the apprentice levy comes in um, every every employer will be required to pay pay a levy um, those those employees who have a, a pay bill of less than three million will be able to claim it back but at the same time there is an awful lot of hot air generated over the the operation of the trailblazer and that's really overshadowed the principles behind the Richard review we have the lift and escalator uh, trailblazer group, um, not led by LEA because the government require it to be led by an employer and currently uh, David, ja uh, David War of uh, Titan Elevators is the chair of the lift and escalator trailblazer group. I'm pleased to say that we actually managed to submit two standards, um, one level three for lifts and escalators, one level two for stair lifts, platform lifts and service lifts. And we managed to do it with two minutes to spare on Thursday the 25th of August. So those are now with biz. We're now awaiting um, their... Oh, sorry, go back. Yes, we're now awaiting their, um, uh, their approval of those, uh, uh, of those standards. 
Um, and the next stage would be to move on to the assessment plan. Uh, how, how, is the, how are the standards that we've produced going to be assessed? Again, it's come back to the, it comes back to the employer looking at what they want, what they think is, is right for, um, for their apprentice. So October the 3rd, the Lift and Escalator Trailblazer Group will convene to start the process of what's in the assessment plan. And there we go, that's the end of my talk. Um, we're going to move on to uh, Stefan now, I think. Roger Lawrence. Um, okay, I'm pleased to present this part of the workshop of, uh, on academic qualifications in my role as a, as a uh, program leader in lift engineering, postgraduate program leader. Uh, so I'm Stefan Kaczmarczyk. Um, however, the, this is a teamwork. So uh, we run our program in lift engineering. Uh, we have a lift technology team. I'm being supported today here by Jonathan Adams, which is sitting here on the front. And he's looking over after a number of points which I'll be uh, talking today. So let me just go um, um, from the beginning. Uh, uh, who you are, probably most of you know, and where we are. We are at the University of Northampton, and we are in two campuses. One is at Park and the other one Avenue. John Sinclair, when introduced today, welcomed you. They said about the history of the university. Uh, just a couple of points about the faculty, which are fast, okay? So there's a new faculty which has been created not long ago. Um, it is now we are with art, science and technology. So we are trying to be fast and we offer um, degree level uh, qualifications in number of subjects and amongst them computing and engineering. Uh, we are in engineering. Uh, so we have laboratories, uh, we carry on a um, number of activities uh, within uh, academic education and research. And one of those is the program in lift, or oh, if you wish, elevator, elevator engineering. So uh, uh, briefly about overall where this program sits. So here we are, a um, number of points when we have um, uh, undergraduate overall typical engineering qualifications, which are in mechanical engineering, mechanical and electrical, uh, electrical and electronic, and also some specialist area like non-destructive testing. Uh, we have uh, then general MSc, which is master's level qualification. And here we are, we've got here in the bottom, but they're not necessarily the last on the, on the um, importance, uh, our provision for lift engineering. What they involve, um, uh, involve a foundation degree, okay, this is higher national certificate agency, master's level, and then I will also mention about further uh, qualifications just PhD and PhD field, which are research degrees, which will lead into what is going to be next uh, to, uh, in, in our workshop. Um, we are being supported by a number of partners. Um, so we have in Northamptonshire, we have partnership with local industrial uh, companies. Uh, internationally we are being supported by in this area uh, in by Thyssen Group and also obviously we work uh, with uh, LIA, with SIPSA, uh, we are also working with the BINDT, with the British Institute of Non-Destructive Testing and uh, IMECI and we are looking obviously for further developments in this sort of list of supporting uh, institutions. Uh, okay, as a background here, where are we coming from, uh, from the, uh, into our engineering program? So this is a bit of historical background. So um, when there was introduction of the first edition of standard EN811, it was now way back in about 1979, and it was introduced in the UK as BS5655. And then what uh, happened, um, the UK lift industry needed to review a re-education of their technical staff. It was dri driven by LIA, uh, then NARM, um, and it was proposed that the best way to do it is via distance learning. And what happened in 1983 was the first set of courses, now being continued uh, uh, through LIA, and this was um, Continuing Education Certificate, Professional Development Certificate. Okay, what happened next was the need to increase and to boost up to get academic, more academic qualifications. Ah, when we went, it was went, um, it went straight to master's level. 
uh, MSc lived engineering. So it was 1998 with the first graduates coming when I joined the team and it was 2002. So I was quite lucky when I joined the team when they were first graduate from master's level. Um, all right, it was not the end of the development. Then uh, in 2003-04, um, foundation degree in lived engineering, followed by a couple of years, few years later, agency in lived engineering and um, research degrees. Okay, uh, essentially, I will mention this later on, uh, this provision is informed by our research program, at least we are trying our best to do that that way. Okay, um, this is uh, a diagram um, uh, which we have produced within the team, which shows uh, how the progression is from uh, the sort of technician level up to higher level. Uh, I think it looks uh, self-explanatory, but uh, basically when you look at this blue path here, so at the bottom we've got uh, uh, apprentice, mechanics, uh, vocation qualifications, and then LEA distance learning course, and then we offer to take the uh, candidates further to educate them and to award degrees. So this will be agency, foundation degree here, master's level. And there are some exit points. So, for example, from LEA distance learning, because someone can go straight to foundation degree or to agency, because as you can see, I'll later explain this uh, scaled down foundation degree. And later, from foundation degree to do more experience, getting masters, uh, getting PhD or MPhil, masters by, by research, and going to consulting or to senior position. Uh, so, this is uh, briefly the path which we are trying to follow. Um, okay, so the qualifications, the following on what was mentioned here, uh, foundation degree, agency, uh, which is, uh, have some common modules of course, masters and research degrees. So we have a partnership with LIA to deliver um, our education program and also partnership with uh, Thyssen Group to deliver innovation and research which informs our teaching as well we do work with some of other companies. Um, Okay, so briefly, well, I start from the foundation degree. Where is this coming from? It's coming from way back in 2000, uh, year 2000. There was a paper produced by then Department of Education Employment, which set the, thre the, the beginning of the foundation degree. It's academic qualifications, typically full-time two years, part-time can be longer. And it is, uh, in order to get these qualifications, as in the UK, we work on uh, credit points. So. Uh, a student can accum must accumulate over their years of study 20, 40, 240 credit points. Um, so two years full time or more um, by part time. Uh, it must be work based learning. So students are employed. A very part of their study is to do the uh, study at their work base. Um, okay, so there uh, must be some links to higher qualifications. That means someone who completed foundation degree would have a path to go to a full undergraduate degree. For example, BSc. <laughs> I'll tell about this later. And there is partnership in college. So partnership with industrial partners, academic partners. That's what, what we want to do. Okay, so this is um, a list of uh, how a foundation degree is uh, structured. All our courses are modular, so it's got uh, modules which have credit points. Uh, students get credit points when they complete the modules. Uh, typically there are two stages, and so I will not read out all those, but basically there are some modules which provide underpinning in science. And that means starting from mathematics, from uh, data leading to the principles of mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and uh, those modules are combined with LIA modules currently being delivered also distance learning. And altogether, when you take and add those um, modules, you need to earn, student needs to earn uh, 240 credit points. Um, so this is two stages, this is divided by two stages. Um, if we take now a couple of distinct points here, um, so, this is a combination of university and LIA modules, right? Designed for those who work in the lift industry. Okay, so um, uh, we, in terms of entry requirements, uh, 
uh, there are requirements in terms of um, high school qualifications, but it is quite uh, flexible. When there is a candidate without real experience, we would require A-level qualifications in maths and some other additional um, uh, GCSE level um, points. Um, so 240 module uh, credit points, and there is a time limit to complete foundation degree, six years. This is quite generous. However, there is quite intensive work involved. As I said, there's a progression way, and someone can go from foundation degree to BSc top up, which uh, is the uh, final year of our three-year degree program. Okay, uh, uh, this is another sort of table how this could be started. Typically, foundation degree could be complete over four years. It is a typical time of completion. So essentially, you divide the modules year one, year two, three, four. Um, and each of those belong to these two stages, which I mentioned early on. Okay, now when we go from foundation degree to agencies, very similar, very similar. However, less work to do. Uh, so instead of uh, 240, 160, module, 160 credits, again, that's the same modules, uh, not all of them, but same modules. Again, the same idea to have uh, accumulate points up to 160 by combination of university modules and LIA modules. Okay, uh, there are some asterisks here. Essentially, uh, only two out of stage two are required. Okay, um, so again, some features, combination of LIA modules and university modules. Um, entry requires very similar to foundation degree, but essentially it is the first year of, of uh, full time of foundation degree. 160 credits and the maximum period of registration is four years. So slightly shorter, uh, but still quite feasible. And you comp can complete typically in three years. So students can go and choose the modules. And then after three years, they can be awarded the qualification. OK, so now quickly, um, I will go into master's level. Uh, this course is the oldest, uh, sorry, this is one of the oldest courses here on the list, um, designed in 1998. Um, and this currently is accredited by uh, IMACI, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. We are working towards further accreditations with SIPSA and possibly with IET. So we will have multiple uh, possibilities. What is the meaning of accreditation? Dave Cooper was later introduced uh, in his uh, presentation. Um, okay, so it is more advanced study um, and involves a number of areas, management, and um, codes and standards, and design and engineering. Um, so it is designed for those who have quite strong background, practical background, and have extensive experience. And also there are entry requirements typically, if someone wants to go straight, it would need to have uh, a first degree in science or engineering. However, we have a scheme when uh, we have a number of completions when students came and completed this without first degree when they enrolled as what we call associate students. That means that they come and take one or two modules and they complete successfully and that the university assesses their work and they can carry on on full course. And again, this is a modular program, and it's got a number of what we call compulsory modules. Okay, these are codes here in, in red, but essentially here, the title you see, they cover a broad range. So the four modules which are uh, what we call taught. Okay, that means um, uh, students do some work. It's a distance learning. Uh, typically, students work and receive uh, their materials at home and they study at home under the supervision of tutorial, uh, our tutors, and involves engineering, safety, management, and later is a project. And the final module, which is from this list, is MSc dissertation. That means it's a bigger piece of work, typically takes about one year to complete part-time. There are a number of other modules which have to be completed, um, namely 
students have to choose two out of those currently on the list is six, seven, seven modules, which address some issues which are for some broader list of uh, systems which are relevant to lift engineering. So um, how individual components work together, uh, how hydraulic system works, how control systems work, what, is, um, what are the applications of microprocessor and electronics, materials, dynamics, and more recently, we introduced vertical transportation. This is a young module being run uh, since last year, which shows uh, vertical transportation and traffic design. Okay, in order to complete the award, uh, students have to get 180 credit points at M level, master's level. So it's different, different level, choosing the, the modules. Um, the the program is distance learning as the other ones. Um, so students get learning materials and um, they uh, typically this is available via our online system web board which is called Nile, Northampton Integrated Learning <coughs> Environment. This is a web-based system and, and then the modules are being assessed by uh, both coursework and examination, depending on the module. Um, the materials are available online and also there is a book based on those materials, which is Systems Engineering of Elevators, which was published in 2011. Okay, uh, dissertations, okay, there are, till now we have um, 70 MSc graduates <laughs> since 1998. And here's a selection, I will not read them out, but you can just have a brief uh, look, uh, what involves uh, all topics which are recently be completed is probably in this group here. They involve uh, advanced work in testing and modeling, as well as the issues of uh, um, the safety, uh, management, and you name it. There's a, currently, you have a base of 70 dissertations from which students can tap on on the, to carry on their studies. And okay, so before I go here, let me just quickly, um, I can't delete it. I will go straight to um, the next level of um, degree qualifications. Um, okay, our MSc, as well as foundation degree and agency is being <coughs> taught um, and is being formed by our research. So we have a developed a research degree program which leads to PhD which is doctorate and MPhil which is masters by, by research. And again, this has been in place now for a number of years. We have a number of completions. Students who complete, for example, MSc are eligible to enroll on the PhD program on MPhil. So there are research in all areas of lift engineering, so like starting from project management, dynamics, um, traffic analysis, testing, <coughs> computer simulation. And we have collaboration links. Uh, we, for example, we have a partnership with local industry as well as international um, companies which can enroll their students to do this uh, pr uh, program. And we have a um, quite successful, recently completed knowledge transfer partnership project in which student, uh, students can, uh, which, uh, researcher can later apply to gain uh, postgraduate pro, uh, research uh, qualification. Okay. Um, okay. There are technical areas for f covered by all our research students which are involved. We have completion with all these areas. So vertical transportation control, power energy, safety, vibrations, and I'll go quickly to the conclusion section, a couple, few points. Um, so um, to conclude uh, why we need to, uh, why we are offering this kind of uh, level of qualifications. Um, first of all, by doing a degree study, students can go deeper into specific technical problems involved in lift engineering, as well in escalator engineering. Um, so essentially, it's being expanded from LIA originally developed modules into 
degree level modules and later allowed to gain research qualifications. And what we are aiming at is to integrate some key elements uh, that means theory, research, innovation and practice. And what eventually leads, it leads to new skills to be, which can be introduced into, back into the industry. And here's a quick diagram where we are. So we have a progression. We provide agency, foundation, degree, masters, and later PhD. And this goes to research and innovation in the lift industry. It's a complete provision which uh, is a long life, long life uh, long long, lifelong academic education. So thanks very much. This is from me. Hear me? Yeah, brilliant. Right. So, having done all that lot and got qualifications, how do you get recognised for it is the question. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to run through briefly through um, the process. There's a two-stage process, essentially, because um, you have what we call the Engineering Council registration and you have professional body um, registration. Um, in the UK there exists a number of what we call PEIs, professional engineering institutions. Uh, and I would suggest to you the, the three relevant ones to um, us uh, in, the, in the lift industry uh, are SIBSI, Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, um, the IET, Institute for Engineering and Technology, which is fa fairly generalist. It, it used to or, or does include the, um, the old Institute for Electrical Engineers and also the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, uh, who obviously um, accredit um, the degree, as Stefan uh, said earlier. What are the benefits of getting yourself registered? Well, firstly, you'll, you'll get noticed, is, is one thing. So you go to a, a professional um, engineering institution, such as SIBSI, uh, and you'd fill out your forms, having got your, your qualifications, and there are other routes which I'll cover in a minute. On your seats, there are membership packs, okay? It will become harder, um, certainly, to operate in the consulting world without being registered. Um, and I'll, I'll give you demonstrations of that as well in, in, in a tick. So the benefits of, of membership are, say, SIBSI. Obviously, you get the, the journal every, every month, which is, is pretty good. You get the knowledge portal. There's access to all sorts of information on the knowledge portal access to SIBSI Guide D and all the other guides, energy efficiency guides, electrical guides, lighting guides, all of those sort of things. There's also the individual societies you can see up there top right. Um, and the one, ironically, that's not listed up there is the LIFTS group. Uh, and we are probably the most active um, of the groups. Um, <clears throat> the networking opportunities, there's tweets and there's Facebook as well. And then the special interest groups, um, ASHRAE um, is for heating. Uh, WIBZ is Women in Building Services Engineering, and YEN is the Young Engineers Network. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, most um, young engineers coming through now, unlike uh, we've done it in the past in our industry, um, and in the building services industry, we are the weak industry in getting people qualified. I have to say that. Um, if you, you heard Stefan say we've only got 70 people who've done MSCs, I mean, 70 people is quite significant. But in, if a general building services engineers, most engineers have, have, have got a minimum of degree. <clears throat> so the benefits of, of EC registration, once you go to your um, professional institution, and I'll cover that um, registration in a minute with them and, and the level you register at, um, you then um, will have the opportunity, depending upon your qualifications or experience, to register with EC UK. EC UK is the engineering council. An engineering council has got a royal charter to register engineers. <coughs> and in fact, to, be, um, to use the term engineer, the, uh, this is dangerous territory, to use the term engineer, you are supposed to be registered under the royal charter. Uh, <coughs> there we go. I thought I was going to get shot for that. I've got away with it. Um, so far. So far, yeah. It's a registration. It, it, registration is an indicator of your professional status. So it tells someone straight away um, you know, that you've, you've qualified or experienced and you've been assessed. Uh, and, uh, and therefore you've been able to gain your registration. Um, it establishes the, your knowledge, understanding and competence in the field of building services, in this case, of fulfilled UK and international standards. Um, as well as the Engineering Council in the UK, there is also a group called FIENI, which is a European equivalent, uh, and some people you will see with Euringe in front of their name, uh, and that's because they've not only registered with the Engineering Council in the UK, 
but they've also registered with FIANI as well. Um, <coughs> registration may give you an advantage over your unregistered peers throughout your career in terms of salary, career progression and professional <coughs> development. And I think that's fair to say, um, to, to be honest. So benefits of it for your employer as well. This is the Engineering Council registration. Confidence that you've attained and maintained a level of recognised international standard of knowledge and experience. Uh, it's a marketing tool, essentially. Verification of your credentials and evidence that you satisfied full assessment of your competence. You haven't just photocopied someone's um, certificate. Uh, you do get checked out. Uh, assurance that you adhere to a professional code of conduct, which is very important as well. Um, ethical considerations, moral considerations as well. Uh, and increased technical credibility. Uh, it certainly does get you more credibi yeah, credibility when you can say I'm a chartered engineer or I'm an incorporated engineer, in my experience. So, then there's the individual professional inst engineering institutions who will be your sponsor to put you forward to the Engineering Council. So, <coughs> SIPSI, Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers, based down in Ballam. Um, they have corporate grades and they have entry level grades. On the corporate grades, there's, there's um, the uh, levels of membership are fellow, uh, member, associate, and licentiateship. And on the entry side, graduate, student, affiliate, and companion. Now, um, looking to the left hand side, um, they all attract letters after your name. So fellow will be F SIBSI, uh, member will be M SIBSI. Um, and these are all accredited postnomials. Uh, and they get accredited by a company called Debretts. Okay? There are some made up um, initials that go after your name. Uh, and some people in this room are using MIAEE, -E, which is member of the Institute, uh, a member of the Association of Elevator Engineers. Uh, in fact, that's a made up uh, uh, set of uh, letters and not accredited at all. Um, so people, people in the know will realise that um, you're using accredited um, memberships and you've achieved that. Where those align with the Engineering Council, if you're a member or a fellow above that, um, you will either be registered as a chartered engineer or an incorporated engineer. Okay? There's three grades. There's chartered engineer, incorporated engineer and engineering technician. And there's three uh, very distinct um, requirements in a, in a matrix issued by um, the Engineering Council as to what's required. And in fact, there are um, new requirements coming into that matrix. In, in fact, ethics has been introduced as an additional um, standard. So an associate, someone who, who's able to re register at associate level uh, will, will probably be registered with the Engineering Council Incorporated Engineer level, licensship at Engineering Technician, graduate um, as an interim um, on their way traveling through as a journeyman, essentially. Um, <clears throat> they are all very important grades. CNG, ING, and ENG Tech are all very important grades. We need all three types. Okay, we need designers, we need maintainers, um, we need installers, that sort of thing. It, you know, uh, don't get any inspectors and, and whatever. So you know, don't get hung up on ING is less than CNG. It, it's different. Um, there are higher requirements for CNG, but it, but it's it's not um, a sub level standard. So the academic standards required for, say, an incorporated engineer, um, post-1999, three-year accredited engineering degree. So you can see it's not given away. Uh, before that, it used to be a BTEC HNC or an HND. Um, during my time, I have to say, the goalposts kept moving. And every time I got to a qualification, when I went to register, they just moved it on a nudge. So uh, hence, I've, I've spent the last uh, 31 years at the University of Northampton. Um, <coughs> Other uh, accredited um, engineering technology diplomas and degrees uh, from the Sydney Accord. And then there's the individual case procedure panel, um, which I'll cover uh, in a tick, because th that will be, I think, especially important for certain people in the room. The academic standard for chartered engineer, um, post-1999, is accredited MEng or a accredited BEng honours degree, or pl well, plus an MSc or accredited, accredited uh, engineering diploma. So not easy. Not easy, the academic route. Hard work, but it's not given away. Before that, it was an accredited uh, BEng honours. Um, there are chartered engineers from many years ago who got it with an ONC, believe it or not. Um, but that's, that's how things have moved on. Again, the Washington Accord has accredited certain engineering degrees. A Fianni 
uh, which is the, um, the Engineering Council's um, um, equivalent in Europe. Um, they also have accredited qualifications, and again, there's this individual case procedure. So the routes to membership and registration with the Engineering Council. The standard route on the left, so you hold the exemplifying qualifications that I've just read out there, okay, and that will, will automatically get you through. But then you have to write, you have to make the application and the engineering practice report. So you have to demonstrate not only your, you've, you've achieved the academic level, but also that um, uh, you have experience and, and, and you've, gained, you know, you've gained your spurs out there in the field. Then you go to a professional review interview, uh, and then <coughs> you're assessed and approved by the SIBSI registration panel, um, and then you get either ING uh, or CENG, and then you, get, you also get the, the uh, appropriate membership of SIBSI with it. The alternative route, if you don't hold any, any qualifications or you do not meet the academic standards, you might still get to ING CENG once your, once your application's been approved, but you have to do the application in the engineering practice report, then a competence review interview, um, and then um, an assessment and approval by the SIBSI members panel. And then you will get down the bottom there either A SIBSI or M SIBSI. So it will depend upon uh, where they think you're at. Um, but that will only get you registration with the professional body, not the engineering council. So then you go into the second stage, <coughs> where you either do further learning to the required academic standard, which again I covered earlier, then you go through professional review, then assessment and approval by the registration panel, and then you get it. Or the alternative, if you don't want to go uh, to university and, and spend five years doing a, a master's degree or whatever, is the technical uh, report route application. It's hard work. Yeah, obviously, as an alternative to five years, they're not going to give it away. So it is hard work. So then you submit your technical report and you go for a professional review interview. And then you go for assessment again and approval by the SIBSI registration panel. Uh, and if you get through that process, um, you, you will um, be able to register with the Engineering Council as well and get the ING or CENG as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the reason this is becoming um, really important is because out there now, um, there are um, some requirements starting to creep in where um, individual standards are saying um, we want a certain level of, of qualification. This is an extract from HTM, and I'm not going to go into it in massive detail because I know Gene is doing um, an, uh, an item tomorrow on HTM. HTM is the Health Technical Manual. Um, it's published by the, the NHS, um, and they have specific requirements. They have identified these um, uh, five um, roles uh, for looking after lifts in the, in the National Health Service. There's the designated person who's appointed by a senior, appointed a senior executive at, at board level with assigned responsibility for the service, you know, for lifts. Then coming down on the right, you've got the trust senior operational manager who is the informed client and the intelligent customer. I'm not sure those two words belong in the same sentence, but um, so they have an important role to play as well. But I'm going to jump down to the two below. The authorised person is an appointed qualified technical engineer specific to the service that they're providing. And then there's the competent person, assessed and qualified craftsperson, again, specific to the service they're providing. But the interesting one is this authorising engineer, which every health trust in the UK is required to have. Uh, and they're quite specific about the role of a, um, uh, an authorising engineer. And this is the extract from... HTM, and it says the authorising engineer will act as an independent professional advisor to the healthcare organisation. The authorising engineer should be appointed by, by the healthcare organisation. So standalone, not within. The authorising engineer lifts, because there are other types of authorising engineer in the healthcare industry, is a chartered engineer. So they're starting to say, we want a certain level of qualification. Um, <clears throat> with appropriate experience, whose appointment is the responsibility of the designated person of lifts. The person appointed should possess the necessary degree of independence from local management to take action within this guidance, including the implementation, administration and monitoring of the safety arrangements defined in BS 7255. So it's starting to be said, okay, and there will be more coming, uh, saying 
are your, you know, the person undertaking this role will be a chartered engineer. <coughs> there is a, a, another um, area where I've seen this coming in as well. Um, oh, sorry, go back one. And that's, <coughs> this came after this incident. This was an incident in Hong Kong, which was discussed at a previous um, event where a counterweight diverter pulley left party company with the counterweight and the, the lift went down the shaft. And you can see down the bottom here, call for workers to be registered. Yeah. So uh, the Hong Kong government have actually started to implement now the requirement to register lift engineers. And when I say lift engineers, I mean lift mechanics as well. Okay, so the requirement to register is becoming more and more prevalent. So on your seats, we've left these packs. Uh, some are graduate packs, some are mem uh, fellow packs. You will fall into different categories. If anyone wants to talk to me about the process of registration and the individual case procedure um, and doing your technical reports, just grab me at some, some point during the, you know, the next day um, and I'll happily talk you through it but it's, it's getting important and it, it will become more prevalent. Okay, thank you. Thank you.